Well, good morning, everyone. Well, not to just spend a whole lot of time on mutual admiration, but I so appreciate Matt and the whole uh, Road family team. Can we give all of them a big, huge round of applause? Every year, this is one of my favorite places to speak, ironically, and I get to speak here every week, but uh, the, the Road Family Conference is just one of my absolute favorite places because not only does Matt do such a great job bringing in teachers and speakers with the exception of the one he's stuck with, but um, he does such a great job uh, with the lineup and, and just does such a great job. The whole team just does phenomenal at setting everything up and preparing and communicating, and I just, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate them, but I also want to tell you how much I appreciate you. Every, every week that I stand in this pulpit, I tell the church here, so if you're a member here, you hear this all the time, but I want to tell all of you, I love you. I love you dearly, and I am so thankful that on a Saturday, you would be here doing this, and I think that speaks very highly of who you are and, and what your, your hopes and your intentions are for you and your family. As I look around, obviously, we're all at different stages. I so appreciated Mitch's lesson this morning. I got to hear the other Mitch during the, the Bible class, and both did a fantastic job. Uh, Mitch and I uh, are at different places in our parenting, and as I look around the room, all of us are at different parts of that journey. I'm, I'm right in the thick of it. I'm right in the thick of it. Stephanie, I'm impressed that you obviously speak the language of our teenager. I, I mean, I was thinking earlier, I mean, I... I taught my kids how to, at least I was partially responsible for teaching them how to speak, and now I don't understand half of the things that they say. And, and even the things that I understand, isn't this ironic? The, even when you kind of catch on and you know, okay, I know what slay means, and I know what cat means, and I, you know, I, once you start to pick up on the vernacular, you're not allowed to use it, right? <laughs> Like, if you don't know what it means, like, then you're kind of out of the loop, and so you're dumb for that reason. But then if you try to use it, then you're not cool for that reason. I mean, I constantly, I'm, I'm telling, the, one of these days, just the whole, the whole sermon's going to be in Gen Z language, the whole thing, and <laughs> they threaten me that they will get up and walk out if that ever happens. So I've, I've, not, I've not tried that yet. Um, but... But as we think about our role in the family, whatever your role in the family is, um, and I think about my role as a dad and as a husband, there's, there's a word that I've been thinking a lot about lately, and that's the word impact. And we use the word impact a lot, and I'm not against the word impact. Well, let's, before we get to that slide, just a second. Um, I'm not against the word impact. I, I think that there, there's an appropriate time to use that and to, to think about impact, but we... We, we are very, we, we, we really want to make an impact. And we talk about making an impact a lot, don't we? We talk about making an impact on the world. We talk about making an impact on the church. We talk about making an impact on our neighbors. We may even think about making an impact on our family. And, and when you come to a conference like this, I don't know about you, but I have a couple different emotions every time I come to a parenting conference. Uh, like the first emotion is, oh, I'm really not doing a very good job. Uh, the second is, I really need to try really hard and do a lot of stuff better. And so you kind of have this, this tendency, or I do at least, to go home and say, okay, I really need to make an impact on my kids for Jesus. I really need to go home and make an impact on my family. I want us to think about what that word impact means. We can go to that next slide. Impact is coming into forcible contact with another object. And that's really kind of what we mean, isn't it? We want, to, we want to make an impact. We want to do something that's powerful. We want to do something that makes a difference. Not a difference five years from now, not a difference ten years from now, but a difference right now. Like, I want to make a difference right now in the world, and I want to make a difference right now in the church, and I want to make a difference right now in my neighborhood. I want to make a difference right now in my family. And we like impact, don't we? We like when other people make a positive impact. We want to make a positive impact for one reason, because we can see it, right? When something makes an impact, you can see the difference that it makes. You think, I, I want to do that. I want to make an impact on people. I want to impact people the way this person impacts people, or I want to impact my family in a positive way. 
But I want to suggest to you that impact isn't always the answer. I, I listened to a podcast, and this is kind of what got my, me thinking about this. And they were contrasting the words impact and influence. And I've been thinking a lot about the difference between those two ideas lately. The difference between making an impact and having an influence. And why we tend to steer more towards the impact than the influence. But how Jesus, a lot of the times, was more about influence. And how the kingdom of God and the way Jesus describes the kingdom and what the kingdom is all about and how the kingdom was going to change the world. Because that's what the kingdom has done and, and what Jesus wanted to do, right? That he wanted to bring the entire world under the rule and reign of King Jesus. But the way that that was going to come about was not so much about impact as it was influence, and this is the way that Jesus was going to change the world. And that's really different, especially when you think about a kingdom, a kingdom that's not about impact. Because every kingdom that has ever existed has been about impact, right? Most kingdoms that come into existence, they come into existence by a forcible contact with another object, right? That's how a kingdom comes into existence. It comes into existence through a battle or a series of battle where there is forcible contact with another object. Either you're going to change or I am, but we, this town ain't big enough for the both of us, right? And so I'm going to drive you out. I'm going to change things and it is going to be a visible change. From now on, nothing is going to be the same and I'm going to push you out and this is going to change and now I'm going to be in charge and not you anymore. That's how every kingdom has ever come into existence. It's come into existence through forcible contact with another object. And so when we think about bringing our family under the rule and reign of King Jesus, when we think about bringing the kingdom to our family, we still tend to think about the kingdom strategies of the world. We think about impact, this forcible contact with another object. And I'm going to make things be different. I want to see a noticeable difference. But let me ask you this question. I really want us to ponder this for a few minutes this morning. How should our parenting strategy mirror the kingdom strategy of Jesus? If the kingdom strategy of Jesus wasn't so much about impact, maybe our family strategy or our parenting strategy shouldn't be either. And this is really what Jesus wanted, is that he wanted to bring the entire world under God's rule and reign. That's what he taught his disciples to pray. Right? When he taught them how to pray, what did he teach them to pray? Our Father who's in heaven, hallowed be your name. And that's a request. Father, we want your name to be hallowed. We want the world to know your name. We want the world to fear your name. We want the world to respect you and honor you. And that's what we want in our house, isn't it? Hallowed be your name. We want God's rule and reign in our, in our home. I do. I think that's why you're here, isn't it? You want your children to hallow the name of God. I was having a conversation just yesterday with somebody about this, this idea of respecting and fearing God's name. And uh, we, we pray together. We try to pray together every single night as a family. And, and sometimes, sometimes a, a joke or two slides into the prayers, you know, or like they, they pray about something, but they're not really asking God. They're really asking mom and dad and trying to change our minds through manipulating their prayers in a certain direction. And, and I fully believe that Jesus has a sense of humor. I really believe Jesus has a sense of humor. But at the same time, we are coming into the throne room of the creator of the universe. And his name must be hallowed. So I want my kids to love God and laugh with God and enjoy God. But I also want them to hallow his name. And that's what, God, that's what Jesus teaches his disciples to pray. Pray, Father, May your name be hallowed. May your kingdom come. Your rule and reign. See, we, we tend to sometimes associate kingdom and the church, and there's definitely overlap there, but 
the kingdom of God is more than, more than what we think of when we think of the church. The kingdom of God means God's rule and reign, his uncontested rule and reign. And someday, someday God is going to be, as Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 15, God is going to be all in all. God's reign is going to be uncontested, unchallenged. Right now, that's not the case. And you know it. And sometimes it's not even the case in our own house. Sometimes that's not even the case in our own hearts. God's rule and reign is challenged. We don't want it to be. We certainly don't want our own kids challenging the rule and reign of God. But Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, Our Father who's in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The the way of life that Jesus taught his disciples was not just about the afterlife. It was about the present life. And Jesus wants, right now, in the here and now, wants people to come under the rule and reign of of God. And that's who Jesus is. Jesus is the Messiah, God's anointed king, who's bringing the rule and reign of God to humanity to bring us under his rule and reign. So that his name is hallowed. So that his kingdom has come and is coming. And will come. And so that his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. So how does this world changing, life changing, culture changing reality come to be? Right? I mean, how does that happen? How does a a dark and rebellious world come to be a place where light is? And where God reigns, where his name is hallowed, not just amongst the Jewish people, but but us Gentiles. How is that going to happen? Through impact? This world ain't big enough for the both of us. I'm going to drive all of you rebels out of here. Is that what Jesus says the coming of the kingdom is going to be like? And if we're going to be like Jesus, disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus, and if we're going to bring our, ourselves and our families under God's rule and reign, what's that going to look like? Look at Luke chapter 17 in verse 20. Luke 17 in verse 20. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be, what's the word? Observed. What? I like to observe things, don't you? I like to see it happening. I want to see it. And Jesus says, it's not not like that. The kingdom of God is not going to come like other kingdoms come. It's not going to come in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. I mean, these people had been waiting for hundreds of years for hundreds of years, for God's rule and reign to be established through the coming Messiah. And I imagine they expected it to come through impact, forcible contact with another object, in particular, the Romans, right? Because they're rebels. They don't hallow God's name. They don't love him. They don't let him rule and reign over their lives. They're not doing his will on earth as it is in heaven. So they need to go. This needs to change. The Messiah needs to come and get rid of the Romans. There needs to be impact, sudden and forcible contact with another object. When's God going to bring that? That's what we're waiting for. If you're the Messiah, then tell us about when the kingdom is going to come. And Jesus says it's not going to come in observable ways like that. It's not going to come through that sort of impact. And you're not going to be able to point and say, oh, there there it is. There's the kingdom. It's right there. But there it is. It's not going to come that way. In fact, Jesus says, it is in the midst of you. In other words, it's already under your nose. Jesus had already been busy planting the seeds. The kingdom was already in the process of growing. 
But it's coming not through impact, but through influence. It's coming by planting seeds. And Jesus had already been sowing the seeds of the kingdom. It was everywhere. It was all around them. It was right there in their midst. It was under their nose. My mama used to say, if it was a snake, it would have bit you. You know? It's right there. Just reach out and touch it. But it's not observable. It's not the way that you think it's going to, to be. And we keep thinking the same kind of way, don't we? That it's got to be something, it's got to be something that comes in and tomorrow it's got to be different than it is today. And we expect there to be some kind of impact that's going to change everything and we just kind of want to change it overnight. And that's what they expected. They wanted the Messiah to come and change things overnight. And Jesus says, it's not going to be like that. It's not going to be this kind of thing where you can say, oh, well, there it is. It's already here. It's already in the midst of you. The seeds are already being planted. Here are some of the ways, particularly in Matthew 13, that Jesus described the kingdom. Think about these. You, you may be familiar with these. Jesus described the kingdom as a sower who went out to sow. This is why Jesus had to tell so many parables, because, because it was hard for them to wrap their mind around. When you've been waiting that long for centuries... When's God going to rule and reign over us and over the world? The prophets said that the Messiah was going to come and the whole world was going to be drawn to him and he was going to bring the, the will and the word of God to the Gentile nations. When's that going to happen? And so Jesus tells these parables for those who have ears to hear and eyes to see. He tells these parables to say, if you really want the kingdom, you need to understand that this is the way it's going to come. It's, when it comes, it's going to be like a sower who goes out and, and sows seed. Now think about the way seed grows. Do you just, I don't know any plant like this, do you? That you plant a seed and then tomorrow, jack and the beanstalk kind of thing, you know, where you come back tomorrow and there's a, a huge plant there? It's not the way sowing works. You don't harvest on the same day you plant. We want impact, man. We want things to be different tomorrow than they are today. We want them to be drastically, noticeably, observably different tomorrow than today. And Jesus says, it's not going to work that way. That's not the way people are going to be brought under the rule and reign of God. God's kingdom is going to be more like a sower going out and sowing seed. It's going to be like planting a seed in the ground. And you water it, and you wait. And you wait. And you wait. It's going to take patience. He described it as a grain of mustard seed, particularly because a grain of mustard seed is so what? Small. It's tiny. It's tiny. You want that thing to become something? You're going to have to wait. I mean, it's going to be remarkable. Don't get me wrong. I mean, when you look at what it becomes versus how it started, you're going to be blown away. But it's not going to show up the way that it ends. When it shows up, you're going to say nothing could come from that. See, this is Jesus' strategy for the kingdom. This is God's strategy for the kingdom. It's going to start small, tiny, seemingly insignificant. And you're going to think, come on. How could that change the world? The whole world? God is going to reign as all in all, he's going to reign supreme over all things. Everything is going to be reconciled to the rule and reign of God. Nothing is going to be in, in competition with or contesting the, the will of God. God's will is going to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And it's going to start like that with a carpenter's son and a ragtag bunch of nobodies. From Galilee, this guy from Nazareth is going to change the world. See, the same is true in our house. Even in your house. If God is going to rule and reign, chances are it's going to, it's going to come into existence like a grain of mustard seed. Number three, leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour. 
I mean, that's the amazing thing, right? There, there's all of this flour and there's this tiny bit of leaven. And Jesus says, this is how it's going to spread throughout the world and how God is going to come to rule and reign. It's going to start like this little bunch of nothing. You think, how could that make a difference? How could that influence? How could that change things? I'll tell you how. Slowly. Slowly. It's going to change things. It's going to change everything. The entire lump is going to be changed, but not through impact, through influence. Not through sudden, forcible contact with another object, but through slow growing influence. Eventually, everything will be touched by it. Eventually, everyone will know God's name. Eventually, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. But it's going to start really, really small, and it's going to grow very, very slowly. Or how about this? A treasure hidden in a field, or a pearl of great price. I mean, the, the whole point of those parables is that they're they're hidden, they're unobservable, people didn't see them, and if they saw them, they didn't recognize the value of them. But when someone did recognize the value, they sold everything and said, that's worth more than everything that I have. That's what the kingdom is like. It's small, it's hidden, it's seemingly insignificant. It's not going to be this huge, grandiose thing where you look at it and you say, that, that's going to change the world. And the same is true in your family. What's going to change your family and take you from where you are to where God wants you to be is probably not going to be some huge, grandiose thing. It's going to be very, very small things. And you're going to have to wait. You're going to have to be patient. You're going to have to allow the rule and reign of God to grow in your home the way that it does in the world. And our prayer in our home needs to be the same that it is in the world. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in my home as it is in heaven. But we need to understand this is the kingdom strategy of Jesus, and I think it needs to be our parenting strategy as well. The, finally, a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. And that's the way, that's the difference between the, the net fishing, the way that they did it then, and the, the fishing pole way we do it now, right? We like impact, right? I want to see it. I want to see that the bait go out there. I want to see the fish grab onto it and pull the line down. I want to reel them in. I want to know I've got something. I'm targeting one fish, and I'm going to make a big impact on that one fish. But not this kind of fishing. It's more like you throw the net out there, and you wait, and you wait. And eventually, either you're pulling the net towards the fish, or the fish are swimming into the net, but eventually, the net will come in, and there'll be fish in the net. And Jesus says, there are going to be all kinds of fish in the net, fish of every kind. The kingdom of God is going to change the world. But it's not coming in observable ways like you expect it to. And that's true in your family as well. And I'm afraid if we don't understand this, th then we, we might not work the way Jesus does. Let's say it this way. Jesus' strategy for bringing the world under God's reign was not sudden and forcible impact, but slow-growing influence. In every single one of those parables, that, that seems to be much of the point. It, it's going to start small. It's going to start in a hidden way. It's going to seem insignificant. People are going to wonder, how is this going to make a difference? How is this going to change the world? But it does. And that process is still happening right now. We believe, don't we, that the kingdom of God has already been inaugurated. We believe that the kingdom of God is in our very midst. So often, though, we, we kind of wring our hands, don't we? And I get it. We look around at the world and we, we say, what's the world coming to? And all this stuff is falling apart and all these things are going on. But do we believe that Jesus reigns? Do we? Do we believe that God, God really is bringing his kingdom? Do we really believe that this has been inaugurated? That this process of the, the seed growing into a tree where all the birds of the air can make their nests. We believe that the net, the net has been cast and the fish are being brought in. Do we believe that this process is happening? And do we believe that it's happening in our home? 
Because sometimes, if you're anything like me, we have a hard time seeing past this very moment, don't we? We, we look at what's going on right now and we say, oh, it's all falling apart. And we just kind of wring our hands and we get so worried. And, and not, not to say that what's happening right now isn't bad, whether in the world or in your home. It very well might be bad. But we also have to practice patience. We have to wait. Because for God to bring people into his kingdom, for them to hallow his name, for his will to be done in their lives as it is in heaven, it takes time. And it doesn't happen the way that we think that it should happen sometimes. I want to look at some of the ways that the Apostle Paul uses this strategy or thinks this way when it comes to churches so that we might see that it's not just Jesus who thinks this way about the kingdom of God. It was Paul who thought this way, and we ought to think this way. Look at 1 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 6. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 6. I don't normally jump around this much on passages, but I want you to see that this is throughout the New Testament. Paul says this, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the what, church? The growth. God gave the growth. Now he's saying this because they're getting really caught up on teachers and the amount of skill and rhetoric that different teachers had and who they followed and who they listened to. And he said, listen, teachers... Teachers are just planters. They're just waterers. Don't get caught up in how great a speaker is. Don't get caught up on, on somebody's use of, of rhetoric or how wise someone seems or, or what the world thinks of that person. It's not them. They're not the ones changing the world. It's God. And if there's any growth that comes from what's planted and watered, that growth comes from God. Now, we know that in the church, don't we? We know Wes is nothing. He's nothing. He's just planting seeds or watering seeds. But if there's any growth, it's not because of Wes. It's because of God. But do you know that in your own home? Do we know that in our own home? Do we know? You're just planting here. You're just watering here. If there's any growth here, it's because of him, not because of you. I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive the wages according to his labor, for we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. This is the way that it's always worked. This is the way people come to be under the rule and reign of God. It, this is what's happened in your life too, isn't it? How many, how many people have influenced you over the years? I mean, stop and think about all the people who contributed to you sitting right here, right now. In fact, some of the people in your past might look and say, they're in church? Really? That's pretty surprising, right? I mean, some people might be surprised that you're here right now. There have been countless people, even people you don't even know their names, and they've had an influence on you. It's taken a while, though, hasn't it? And you're still a work in progress. I'm still a work in progress. But somebody planted. And somebody planted again, planted again. And somebody watered and watered and watered and watered and watered and watered. And here we are. But it's God who gets the glory. Because he's bringing us into his kingdom so that his will is done in us as it is in heaven. And the same thing is going to happen in our family. That's our job is to plant and water. You can't, you can't control whether or not the plant grows. God is in control of the growth. And so we have to understand this is the way God's influence grows. This is the way it works through tiny amounts of incremental growth. That's the way plants grow, isn't it? Tiny, I remember in kindergarten or preschool when we would plant little seedlings, you know, in your classroom, you plant a little seed, especially when you're five, I mean, like a week is a good percentage of your entire life, you know, I mean, that seemed like eternity before you saw any growth at all. Sometimes we're no better as adults waiting on the world or waiting on our family or waiting on the church or waiting on ourselves to grow. But this is the way growth happens. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 14. 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. Paul saying about the church, he says, We urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, 
What does admonish mean? It means warn, warn them. And if somebody's going off track, if they're not living the way that they're supposed to, warn them. Encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See, what, I, what I'm encouraging you, what I think Paul, what Jesus is encouraging you, is not passive parenting, it's patient parenting, right? It's not passive parenting, it's not saying, oh, just, just wait, everything will be fine, just don't worry about it, you know, everything will be fine. I, I, we know that's not true. He's not saying be passive, but he is saying be patient. Now, there is a time to admonish and encourage and help, but notice what he says to do for everybody. Be what? Patient with them all. Be patient with them. So yes, admonish your kids. Encourage your kids. Help your kids. But be patient with them all. Growth takes time. It's not passive parenting. It's patient parenting. I don't know what the future holds. Honestly, I don't know. And I mean, this scares me to death. As it does, I'm sure, all of us. I, I don't know whether my, my sons will ultimately reject Jesus or not. I don't know. I wish I did. That's the thing with sowing on different soils. I don't know. And I'm not in charge of that. And I can't control that. We've had a lot of conversations recently. Sometimes my kids have been brutally honest. You know, some of my favorite conversations. We had one just this morning on the way here. Some of my favorite conversations are when my kids are making fun of me. That happens a lot, but I'll be more specific. Um, so, so my favorite conversations are when they say, yeah, I bet in that kind of situation you would say, and then they do the you know, crazy dad voice, you know, and they make up what they think I would say in that situation. I told myself I wasn't going to talk about the Rangers win. It's really short, I promise. But when the Rangers won, um, you know, of course, they go in the locker room and they have the celebration and there's champagne, there's beer everywhere. And, um, we were watching that as a family. We're huge Rangers fans and, you know, they were celebrating. My son is actually playing baseball right now and he, he's pretty sure that in four years he's going to be in the World Series. So, um, so he knows, he said, I don't know what's going to happen next year or the year after that, but in four years we're going back because I'll be there. So... Um, <laughs> He's 15 right now, by the way. Um, so he's sure that when, when uh, he's straight out of high school, he's going. But we had this conversation about, about the, the locker room celebration and all the, all the booze. And I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything about it. And, and they both said, yeah, I bet if Malachi was playing, you'd say, you better not be in there, you know, da 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 <laughs> I was like, well, I don't know. Uh, and just this morning, we had another conversation where my, my youngest was talking about what, what to do to get into a place if the gate is locked. We, there's a way to get in there. I know what you would say is da 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 And I was like, you know what? It's really not a bad thing that you guys think you know or you do know what I would say in a given situation. It makes me feel really good that you know what I would say in that situation. But I have no idea whether or not you're going to do it. No idea. I don't know. In fact, I do know that many of the times you're not. You're not going to do what you know I would say in that situation. Sometimes you're going to know that what God would say in that situation, and you're going to do the opposite anyway. I know that. I just hope and pray they come back. But I'm not in control of that. I'm not. All I can do is plant. All I can do is water. All I can do is influence. I don't know what the future holds, and I'm not encouraging us to be passive. Teach them, encourage them, admonish them. If you see them going off the rails, tell them. Plead with them, pray, and let them hear you praying that God's will might be done in their life as it is in heaven. But be patient with them. Be patient with them. You should expect and encourage growth, but you can't expedite growth. You should expect it and encourage it. If you plant a seed in the ground, you are right to expect it to grow. And you are right to encourage it to grow. Water it, fertilize it, give it lots of sunshine. Encourage it to grow. But you can't shortcut the process. You can't expedite the growth process. 
It's like the butterfly in the cocoon, isn't it? You try to break him out early, you're going to destroy everything. We wish we could expedite the growth process, speed it up a little bit. Let's get you from where you are to where you need to be, and let's do it right now. I want to make a big impact in your life, son. I love you, and I want want you to be right and know right and do right all the time. It's not how it works. It's never how it's worked. It hasn't worked in the world. It hasn't worked in us. It's not the way it's worked in us. God has allowed us to grow. And we try to rush the process. We impede the process, don't we? When we try to rush things, when we try to expedite the growth, we impede the growth. Because what happens? I mean, you know this, when, it, when you're trying to teach your kid how to walk or you're trying to potty train them or teach them how to read, whatever it is, you want them to get from where they are to where eventually you know they need to be. When you try to rush it, you get anxious, they get anxious, you get frustrated, they get frustrated, you get mad at each other, we drive a wedge in between us. That's what happens spiritually too, doesn't it? We can wring our hands all day long that the world is not what it ought to be. We can wring our hands all day long that the church is not what it ought to be. We can wring our hands all day long that our home is not what it ought to be. But taking whomever from where they are to where they need to be is a slow process. And what you can do and I can do is plant the seed and water the seed and wait We can expect the growth, we can encourage the growth, but we cannot expedite the growth. You cannot rush this process. And the more we try to rush the process, the more we impede the process. So, if our kids are going to be lifelong followers of Jesus and live under the reign of God, it's going to take time, it's going to take patience, it's going to take grace, it's going to take mercy. Let me ask you this question. Was your spiritual growth complete at 13? How about 18? How about 21? I was thinking about those numbers. I was baptized really young. Most of my mistakes, the big things that I look back on and really regret, happened right in those years. I mean, even when I reached 21, 20, 21, oh, I look back and think, oh, What was I thinking? What was I doing? Why is it that we think 18 is the finish line for spiritual growth? I mean, we're telling ourselves that, aren't we? I mean, I have this mental time clock in my head, this mental uh, hourglass in my head that says, my kid's 15, he's going to be 18 before I know it, and, and that's it. That's it. He better be grown and mature by then. Who told you that? Who told you that? Who told you that you have until 18, and by 18, they better be spiritually mature? Because you know that wasn't true for you. Certainly wasn't true for me. Growth takes time. And if we're going to influence our children towards who they should be in Christ, it requires patience. It requires us to be as patient with them as God has been with us. Be as patient with your child's spiritual growth as God has been with yours. What if we took that approach with our kids? Admonish them, yes. Encourage them, yes. Help them, yes. Teach them, yes. Absolutely. Discipline them, absolutely. But be patient with them all. Be as patient with them as God has been with you. You weren't spiritually finished when you were 13. You weren't done when you were 18. You weren't done when you were 21. You're not done now, are you? I'm not. You still have a long way to go. And God keeps showing us patience and mercy and grace. So we've got to do that with ourselves and with our kids. Be as patient with your children and their spiritual growth as God has been with yours. Thank you, church.